Hello, and welcome to this installment of the Future Grind podcast. I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and today we'll be speaking with Anastasia Sin, a Las Vegas-based magician that uses her over two dozen implants both in her live performances and in her daily life. Anastasia is a pioneer in the biohacking and transhumanist communities, using her network and creativity to think up incredible new uses for implanted technology. Anastasia has been prominently featured in national and international media, and she has testified in support of augmentative technology in front of the Nevada State Legislature. She also stars in a new Hulu documentary profiling her husband, famed comedian and magician The Amazing Jonathan. We discuss Anastasia's use of implants, her path to the biohacking community, her vision for the future, and much more. As always, show notes and links are available at futuregrind.org. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever podcasts are found. A video version of this episode is posted on Facebook and YouTube. Make sure to subscribe on all of these platforms, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. If you'd like to keep this podcast running, you can donate at futuregrind.org forward slash support. Or you can purchase some of our newly released products at futuregrind.org forward slash store. Because of you, this is Future Grind. All right, and now we are here with Anastasia. Anastasia, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I'd say that you are constantly evolving. An interest in magic led you to becoming a stage performer, and your discovery of the work being done in human augmentation led you to becoming actively involved in the biohacking community. So how did you discover these communities, and how did you become so deeply involved in them? Well, okay, so to to start, I became a magician, like just a general magician, uh, probably about 15 years ago. And it was because I was watching Chris Angel's Mind Freak on television. And I thought, wow, that's really cool stuff. Ran to the magic shop, bought as much stuff as I could and just started practicing behind the bar where I was working at the time. And it kind of evolved from there into working in film and then doing some film consulting for magic. And then uh, once I moved to Las Vegas, my daughter came to move uh, in with us. And she was really into gaming and uh, she saw this girl online who had a microchip implant that she used to unlock her computer and she showed it to me like, mom, isn't this cool? I think I want this. And I said, I want that (laughs) because most most teenagers aren't used to hearing that from their parents. So I did some research and I found out where I could get some and I ordered one from Dangerous Things and popped it in. And then I had a friend come over and put a magnet in my finger. And from then things just kind of exploded once I realized that I could program these chips to use in my act. I wanted to know more. I wanted to know everything I could. So the first company I reached out to was Grindhouse for more information. And then I just learned and learned and learned everything I could and started using myself as a kind of guinea pig with new ideas and chips and anything I could. And then trying old magic tricks and seeing how I could change them to work with my implants. Yeah, I remember when you first reached out to Grindhouse Wetware. We were very excited to see your email come through because it was clear to us that you were already quite accomplished and were using these implants in some experimental new ways, which we were very interested in. And it's amazing to see how far we've come in those few short years. So I'm very glad you reached out to us. Me too. I'm so glad I got your last bottle note. (laughs) Yes. And it seems you jumped into getting some implants pretty much as soon as you found out about them and were excited about the potential right away. This is a very different reaction to the one that most people have. Why do you think you were so instantly excited and willing to get involved when others have a much more negative reaction? Oh, that's a really good question, and I wish I knew the full answer to it. I know that I'm drawn to it because I can see the bigger picture. I've been falling in love with movies like Johnny Mnemonic, and not just because I have a crush on Keanu Reeves, but that movie has always had a huge place in my heart, and I didn't even know it was a William Gibson story until Tim Cannon told me, and I had no clue. I just thought, what a great movie. I wish we could all be like that. I want a spider, Henry Rollins' character, implanting and upgrading me. And that was always in the back of my head, but I never thought in a million years that we could have anything like that really in my lifetime until my daughter showed me this chip. And 
then I saw what you guys were doing. And I saw that video you made where I believe Tim was blindfolded using the bottle nose and able to sense things. And that's the thing that really turned me. I said, whoa, if magicians could do that, that's a whole nother aspect of magic that we could totally explore and create new tricks for magicians, like sensory tricks, because we do a lot of stuff like that. And um, I don't know why other people might be so disturbed by it. I know a lot of people can't even look at my implants if they're sticking out of the skin without getting nauseous. So I think it might be people who are afraid of blood, people who are queasy, people who are religious, especially. I'm a hardcore atheist, um, supporting the James Randi Educational Foundation since day one. And I I just can't get with that mindset. And I wish I wish other people weren't so queasy about it, but I really do think for them, it might come down to just general queasiness and the fear. Like why take a risk in their head? Why should I be the one to take a risk? What if I get cancer from this? What if, what if, what if? better not to even bother trying. And I don't think that way. I never have. So I'd rather try and, and make an advancement than not try and, and not. <laughs> so do you have any idea of how long ago that was? When did you get your first implant? That was only about just under three years ago. So not very long. I haven't been doing this for very long at all. And um, it's it's amazing how quickly everything kind of snowballed into what it has now. I ended up on the cover of a magic magazine as a cybernetic uh, character, like half cyborg, half human. And they did an article based on how I was using all these cybernetics and magic and trying to advance magic. And there's a lot of magicians that think that's stupid because I come from an old boys school career. You know, magic is not traditionally a women's thing and it's, everyone likes to adhere to the old school way of doing things in magic. And if you can't do cups and balls and all the classics and linking rings, then you're not a magician. I don't think that way at all. I've always been someone who loves gimmicks, which are things that magicians use to achieve an effect that the spectator is not aware of. So what could be better than that or for that than implants? So I don't want to make you give up any of your closely guarded secrets here, but I know you use these implants in your magic acts. Can you give us an idea of some of the ways you can use these implants while performing? Yeah, um, I'll give a few of the secrets away. Um, the the magnets that are in my left hand, I have quite a few of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I use those in a lot of coin manipulations, so where magicians can... and also cards that have metal shims in them. But where magicians can traditionally palm a coin, I can actually fool magicians by keeping my hand more open than anyone ever has and have a coin produced from behind it because my magnets are holding onto it. I can do that with any piece, any object that's light enough for my hand to hold up or my magnet in my hand to hold up, like a, a playing card or a heavy coin that has a magnet in it or a um, steel ball. I can hold all of those things and keep them hidden. So that's the sleight of hand aspect is just killer. I mean, I can, I blow magicians away with that if they don't know I have implants. Once they find out, they think it's really cool and they start thinking themselves about how they could use magnets in their hands specifically for doing manipulations. So that's probably the closest thing I've found to really interesting magicians. Um, I have one in my arm that's about two inches across and it's at a place where when I, I vanish something, you know, how I vanish it, I wave my arm over you that magnet will literally pick up anything in the spectator's hand or on the table and I can distract with the hand connected to that arm. So if that makes any sense, if you can visualize me pointing or touching your shoulder and vanishing a coin on your hand at the same time, you don't even know what just happened. And then I can stick my bare arms out and flip my hand from left to right. And my magnet is in what I call a sweet spot. So when I flip my arms over back and forth, you cannot see the magnet. It gives you the illusion that I'm showing you both sides of my arm, but actually I'm not. There's a, a sweet spot where I'm hiding something where my magnet has picked it up. So there's two ways. Um, the microchips I program for all sorts of different things from opening lock boxes. There's tricks where you put a bunch of keys inside a glass and only one of the boxes will open with one key. It's a mentalism trick. I don't want to go into too much deal, detail about this, but because of my chips, I'm able to open the boxes when I want to and allow the the act to go the way it's supposed to. Um, I can use chips to unlock uh, NFC locks. So for escapes as well, where if I'm pinned to a wall and my hands are locked up and I'm in an X position and my feet are locked up, the chips that are in my feet will actually unlock the padlocks that are attached to the bottoms of my legs, if that makes sense. Um, I'm having a bit of a problem developing that one. It's because 
the padlocks don't read the anything but a, a flex style chip implant very well. And they also beep once they open, which does not help the act at all. It makes it kind of gives it away that it's technology. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of that sound. Yeah, it sounds like there are a lot of different ways in which this can be used. And what I'm really excited about is that this is still the early days. We've only just begun seeing where this can take us, and I expect much more innovation from you and others in the future. I know that implanted magnets have been used by a few magicians for a while, but you seem to have really taken this to the next level, and in particular have pushed forward the use of RFID chips. To the best of your knowledge, was this something that people were already doing when you got involved, or were you the first? Um, I, as far as I know, I'm the only one uh, who was doing it when I started doing it. I know that now I have a friend out in England. His name's Alan Rorenson. He's doing some really great stuff, and he has the ability to program, which I do not. So he's able to write apps that specifically go with his chips, and he's got a really great magic mind. So the stuff that he's developing is going to be really cool to see come out. And then, you know, of course, the, 10 years ago when people were getting magnets in their fingertips to hold up a paper clip, there was one magic trick that you could do with that magnet. So some magicians were doing that. There's also a little uh, trick that you can hold in your hand that has a magnet activated motor. So people were using the magnet in their fingertip to activate that motor. Uh, the problem is the majority of the finger implants weren't large enough to activate it. So you actually had to get um, the largest size that Sampa had. Sampa is a, a guy out in Germany who does implants. You may be aware of him. Um, but he had a very large cylinder implant and that would actually trigger a lot of the motors that work with a lot of tricks. And once I found out that I could do that, I put these magnets everywhere so I could activate the motors all different places in my body, not just my fingers. Yeah, you said you put these implants everywhere and I think that's an accurate statement. You've only been doing this for a few years, but in that short time you've become one of the most implanted people that I know, which is saying quite a bit. So how many implants do you have? And how many of them are magnets or RFID or something else? Um, I have 26 implants now, and 11 of them are magnets. The rest of them are microchips of different frequencies. So I have the NFC frequency. I have the, the 125. So those are the ones that work best with my lock boxes. And then the 137 works with like these weird medicine cabinets that I have um, that I'm trying to build into something else. I'm working on on better ones, like ones that light up. I'm getting those put in soon. And so that's really for nothing else other than when I'm staying in hotels and I put my hand on the hotel door that I'll have like a stream of lights lighting up the side of my hand. So that might trip some people out, especially if I can keep it hidden under the flesh deep enough so that they don't quite get where it's coming from. Uh, yeah, I can definitely see that freaking some people out. Right? And that will be very interesting <laughs> when you get that going. But you have way more experience than most when it comes to having these things implanted and living with them which means you also have a much higher chance of experiencing a problem. So have you faced any issues? Have there been any rejections, health concerns, or horror stories? Well, all of my implants for the most part are fine. I don't have any problems with my chips. Um, the one that's really large in my forearm, for about three months, I had pain in the opposite side of my arm, and I was genuinely concerned that it was from having such a large implant that was hard rubbing against the bone of my arm and the muscle. I mean, we can expect that there's going to be some tissue and bone erosion. That's just to be accepted and expected. But um, I was worried because I shouldn't feel any pain on the other side of my arm. It turns out it was just tennis elbow. I had nothing to do with the implant whatsoever. It's completely fine now. I've been checking my liver and my kidneys to make sure everything's okay and I'm not doing any internal poisoning by having this many implants. I haven't had any problems there either. Um, the most annoying thing, I guess, would be whenever we go to Cheesecake Factory, they have really high quality silverware that my arm will suck across the table, like three inches if it goes anywhere near a knife. I'm constantly pulling cutlery off my arm. So ah, yes. it's the only inconvenience. And it's kind of funny. My husband laughs at me every time it happens. So. so don't get in trouble for stealing any silverware from there if it just sticks to you and you walk out. Right? That's exactly what I mean. Or if it sticks to me and then I stand up and it hits the floor because of the inertia of me standing up. It's kind of embarrassing. But yeah, other than that, I'm quite happy with them and I've had no problems. You are a pioneer in this field in terms of the size of the implants you're working with, and you're using non-traditional placements and using them in never before seen ways, which is pushing boundaries not just for magicians and performers, 
but you're making discoveries about these things that can be useful for other people who are working with different implants. So how are you sharing your experiences and passing on what you learn? Well, I attend all the biohacking conferences I can. I go to Grindfest. I didn't this year, but I did last year, and I share my information that way. Um, and I'm actually developing a lecture specifically for magicians that will be put online. And then there's a large magic distribution company called Penguin Magic. They're interested in putting it out for me. And magicians will hopefully uh, get it on a grand scale that way. If they do watch this lecture, they're going to learn a lot about how these enhancements can be used to do tricks. Um, we are saying non-traditional placements. One of the things that I forgot to mention that I was working on, that I'm still working on, is a finger, a cybernetic finger that I can screw off and show and then screw back on and heal back and make it work. And this is a mix of a magic trick and the implants, but I have a, a magnet right over my knuckle and another one on the finger below it. So I can actually have this little gimmick of a fake finger with blinking lights inside of it. And you, it, it's able to stick to my finger. It just doesn't, I'm having a hard time making it look as real as possible. So I've tried different prosthetics companies. I've had to go with different weighted fingers, but it's a constant development and something I want to share with other magicians. And the more things that I can come up with, I think the more I can pull into the fold. There's some that are really interested in it and some who are really queasy by it. And it's mostly the young ones that want to see what I'm doing. The old guys just think I'm crazy. They're like, just learn how to force a card, girl. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to get into that. Because it seems that many people are inspired by your work and want to use these implants in their own acts, but then others largely reject it and think of it as not real magic. Exactly. And I know that you are personally friends with a lot of very big names. So how do the people in the community react to what you're doing, and what feedback do you get from them? Um, well, the, honestly, let's see, Johnny Thompson, who is probably like the godfather of magic, who was like a father to me who passed away in March. Uh, at first, when I first started showing him these implants and I first got them, he looked at me and he shook his head and he's, he was 84 and he'd shake his head and say, hey, Anastasia, what are you doing, honey? You know, I could just teach you. Blah, 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 blah. And he said, Johnny, it's not about that. It's about trying to create something new. And he didn't think much of it. When I came at him with this arm magnet, the large one I was telling you about that I use for all kinds of different vanishes and how it's in that sweet spot of my arm. And I showed him that and how I could palm a coin and pull it out of nowhere where he doesn't look like I'm palming anything. He was blown away by that. So at that point I won over, I won him over and he was over 80. So that was a big plus. Um, when I went to magic live last year and I demonstrated the same thing for Chris Angel, who is very religious and who, who I adore. He's a good friend. He, he wasn't so thrilled. <laughs> He's like, Anna, what are you doing? What if this kills you? What if you get cancer? Is it worth it? We need you here. You know? And I said, it's, it's not a worry. It's I'm doing everything intelligently and smart and trust me, I'm not going to die from this. And if I'm, if I think that I'm going to, well, pull them out. I'm really, really careful with what I'm doing. So I kind of convinced him, but you know, there's a perfect example of someone who, who thought what I was doing was a little nuts. And when many people hear about these implants, they question them. They want to know why something would be implanted when its function could be accomplished with a wearable or other external device. And your use in magic, I think, is a perfect example of why people might want to implant them. People can build acts and careers off of their implants. But what's their use beyond that? How do you use your implants in your day-to-day -day life? Oh, well, in my day-to-day -day life, I have a, a door, like my front door lock. I think a lot of people that have the microchip implant in their hand have this or a way to start their motorcycles. I like to just enter my house with it. Um, you know, the other people in my house have key fobs to make it work. I get to just use my hand. That makes me feel special. I would like to put a car start uh, thing inside our GMC, but my husband's not down with that. He is willing, however, to look at getting a Tesla, and now I'm really excited because I'm hearing that Dangerous Things is customizing Tesla keys so that you can unlock them with your hand. Um, so I would do that if I had a Tesla. And other than that, the magnets, the big magnet on my arm, when I was setting up for the Academy of Magical Arts Awards probably about two months ago in Los Angeles, I realized how handy it came to hold about 20 safety pins while I was pinning a whole bunch of curtains to the wall. <laughs> it just, instead of having someone pass them to me, you have to find them on the floor. They were always just right there. Same thing with nails. I can hold, if you were working as somebody who was 
um, you know, hammering nails on a roof. You could put literally 20 nails on a magnet this size and it would just, they just stay there and you grab them as you need them. I know people are like, well, I could also put a magnet on my belt. Yeah, you could, but I'd like to put it inside so that we can actually advance this technology and just keep making people more cybernetic. The more people that do it, the faster it's going to advance. And even for silly reasons like holding safety pins when you're doing your sewing. Yeah, you mentioned advancing this technology, and that's something you're doing now. Most of your implants so far have been magnets or RFIDs, but you're quickly moving beyond that with some custom designs. Can you talk a bit about what's to come and what you're working on now? Yes, the one that I'm really, really excited about is something I'm working on with Cooper and Cassix, and it's a NFC Wi-Fi Bluetooth Linux computer for my thigh, and it would be about the size of a deck of cigarettes. Um, and the ideal thing is I want to use the magnet that's inside the tragus of my ear, which vibrates off of a copper wire. I have a Bluetooth Hero 800. It's usually a neck loop that people wear when they have a hearing aid in, and it works for me without the hearing aid because it. I can hide it inside my hair piece. I have this, these big hair pieces that I wear when I'm on stage and I can just hide the copper wire so that my braids actually have copper wire in them and they're transmitting back or they're transmitting out. So imagine, for example, I've developed a card that's an NFC card. You can program it. It's the queen of hearts. She has an NFC sticker in her and she has a blinking light in her eye and a blinking light in her heart. And I would love to be able to take an entire deck of cards, put NFC tags in all of them as to what they were, and I can take a card blindly, wave it over my leg, the NFC would read it, and by Wi-Fi it would send it to my phone, to the app that my friend Alan is going to write, and then through Bluetooth send it to my hair, which sends it to my ear. So in real time, anything I wave over my leg that I've programmed with an NFC tag, I will hear what it is in real time. So I can be blindfolded and just put something on my lap and I know what it is. Now, there's lots of ways to achieve that as a magician, but I think that this is a proof of concept way of achieving it more than anything, and um, I, I can't wait till we have it ready to go in. Should be soon. Yeah, you talked about working with Cooper from the Dangerous Minds podcast and Cassix of Augmentation Limitless on this new implant, and they are two very well-respected people in the community, and their work is definitely worth checking out. And I also wanted to mention that I have one of those playing cards that you sell, and I think they're great. I'm definitely not a performer or magician or anything, so there's no trick involved when I show it off, but I love letting my friends light up the eyes and the heart, and it's always interesting. Yeah. So great work with that. Thank you. And I know you're not only experimenting with implants, but are also interested in wearable devices and fitness trackers, kind of from a quantified self approach. What has your experience with those been? And are there any that you like in particular? Yeah, the my favorite, absolute favorite, because I deal with major anxiety and it comes with um, comes with the life I live. I have a really I have a strange life. I mean, it's a, a lot of people look at my life and think, oh, you're so lucky. But I have a lot of responsibilities and things that I have to deal with on the day to day with my husband being quite a celebrity in the magic world. And his health problems and how much he is in the forefront, especially now, which we can go into later. Um, but it's a lot of stress to deal with. So I have an, a wearable that's my favorite that's called the Spire. And it's waterproof already. You can actually throw it in your washing machine in case you forget to take it off your clothes. But you wear it for a woman. You would wear it um, in the middle of your bra strap. And it monitors your breathing. And if your breathing becomes erratic, it sends you a text message to your phone and tells you to chill out and actually opens up a breathing exercise. And I found this to be so incredibly helpful so that I don't have to pop half a Valium if I'm freaking out because I really would rather not do things with pills. I would like to learn how to breathe properly and just be more in a calm state on my own. What I'd love to do is figure out how to coat this and implant it because it is charged magnetically and I don't know if it's already waterproof. I think that we might have the outgassing issue solved by the manufacturer already. <laughs> so who knows? Um, I also don't know if the coating is going to still work. So there's, that's going to be our next experimental thing is trying to implant my favorite, my favorite wearable. Um, and the company seems pretty interested in that. And there's another company that is called Ori, O-R-I-I. And they make a bone conduction finger ring that you can wear to make a phone call with your finger in your ear. And I got one of those. And when I got it, I was kind of disappointed because I didn't think it was as good as the magnet I already had implanted in my ear. And so I wrote them 
And they immediately wanted to Skype me from Hong Kong and talk to me about this implant in my ear. And now I use bone conduction technology um, inside my skull. And they are more than willing to build a bone conduction Bluetooth tooth because I'm actually working towards getting a full set of dentures that are cybernetic. That's the big project that I really, really want because I've never been happy with the physical appearance of my teeth. And, you know, I used to eat glass as a sideshow performer for a few years and it did a lot of damage to my molars, which I've since had removed. So now what I have, um, I don't look like, like a farmer, <laughs> hick, whatever, but I have, I have just front teeth and so when I smile, everything's fine, but I'd like to remove the front teeth, have fully cybernetic dentures put in. So like one tooth, you come out, you, you can pull one tooth out and it's a USB storage unit. You can push a button on another tooth. And when I smile, I actually have a light built into one of the front teeth that flashes like a bright white flash that distracts people, which is excellent to use as a magician. Um, I have that built into a, a thumb device already, but it would be 10 times better if I could smile and wink and have a light come out of my mouth. It would be insanely funny. And uh, the Bluetooth would actually be the best bone conduction thing I could possibly install in my head because I could literally put my mouth open near somebody's head and they would hear what I'm hearing. So it turns me into like a human radio almost. It's much louder to come in contact with your teeth than it is with just floating around the tragus of your ear. It's because it's pushing right against your bone. So it sounds like you wouldn't really have any issue in the future augmenting yourself to the point that you might actually become more technological than you are biological. Is that accurate to say? That's a thousand percent accurate to say. My husband thinks I'm crazy because I told him, you know, honey, if I could donate my arm to science and have them lop it off to keep the nerves fresh, to put something in there, I would do it. I, and he thought that was the craziest thing he'd ever heard. And I think, honestly, I haven't, I, I think that's the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. If I actually had the trust in someone who had the ability that they could actually make me a cybernetic arm that was better than my existing arm, I would do it immediately. So we've been talking about one type of biohacking and have focused on DIY human augmentation using implanted tech. But there's another branch of biohacking that is more interested in biology, whether that's genetic modification or using nootropics and other substances for cognitive enhancement and mood alteration. Do you have any involvement with this other type of biohacking? Um, as far as the nootropics go, I've tried modafinil. And that's gotten me through some days when I haven't slept very well. And I'm not someone who really likes upper drugs. Um, so I felt like this actually worked to just remove my tired and bring up my intelligence level for the day. So I really liked it. Um, I don't take it that often, more like just if I need an edge for the day. Uh, I couldn't take one today, unfortunately. So um, other than that, you know, I tried the that butter coffee thing. I didn't really notice a difference other than it kept me full. I know a lot of people think that they're DIY biohacking if they put butter in their Dave Asprey coffee. Um, other than that, no, not so much. So what is your goal? It sounds like you want to extend capabilities and push the technology forward. But at the end of the day, is it life extension or overcoming limitations or what drives you? Uh, the end goal is probably life extension. I, you know, when it all comes down to it, we're all afraid of dying. I'm an atheist. I don't believe we're going anywhere when we die. Um, I would like to go into a computer that would be fine with me. I'm, I'm fully aware that a life, life extension as a human or being able to replace my organs and stay somewhat similar to what I am now, like a crossbreed between a cybernetic person and a, and a biological person that's great. But if you do die, I would also like that option of having your brain uploaded into some kind of construct so that it exists in some way forever. Even if that's not a tangible way that I can even fathom in my brain right now, it's still better than, than lying in the ground and rotting, I think. There is a word that is often used to describe the philosophy, which I think you just put forward there, and that is transhumanism. But many people reject this term even if they meet its definition because they feel that there's a stigma attached to it or they don't want to be associated with others who may adopt this label. So do you consider yourself a transhumanist? Um, I do consider myself a transhumanist because I do believe that, that is how you describe somebody that wants to have more cybernetic enhancements and better themselves through technology and 
life extension being a possibility. I don't really, um, I'm not familiar. I I got associated with the transhumanist party recently and I started reading some of the stuff they're putting out there and it kind of freaked me out a bit. I was like, "Ah, I don't really see eye to eye with everything that you guys are saying. Um, so, and I've never been someone who's into politics and until recently when I was kind of thrust into it because I had to, because you can't let some things happen. Um, but yeah, I, I, for all intent and purpose, I will call myself a transhumanist and, um, you know, I support what the transhumanist party does. I don't know if I'm an actual party member. I would have to really know what their stance is and research a lot more before I could say I was like a political party member of it. But as a single standalone person, yes, I am a transhumanist. You alluded to your recent involvement in politics there, and I'd like to explore that further. You're of course referring to some work you did in April of 2019, when there was a bill making its way through the Nevada state legislature that would essentially outlaw RFID tags and many other implants. And you actually testified in front of the Nevada Senate Judiciary Committee to oppose this bill. Can you talk a bit about that and your involvement there? Uh, Yeah, the bill basically said, um, you know, I I had just come home from a gig and I was written by a friend saying, oh my goodness, this is happening in Las Vegas. Can you you help? And I, I read the bill and it literally said that anyone who has an RFID implant would have to pay a fine, whether it was voluntarily uh, put in or not. And you couldn't have a bodily autonomy choice of having microchip implants. And basically, this would have instantly made me a criminal considering how many I already had. (laughs) And I couldn't let that happen to me or my friends. And so I got up after three hours sleep and went down and I was the only person in a room testifying to a bunch of senators in Carson City, Nevada. And I went right after a guy who I guess is the person Skip Daly. He's the person who put the bill forward. And he had just gotten off uh, him and five other people had just spoken about how nobody has these implants anyway. They are repugnant. I think that was the word he used. Um, you know, we need to get ahead of this because people can be tracked with them. He had very, very convoluted ideas of what these microchips did. And so someone had to set him straight. So after they went and spoke everything that they wanted to say, I basically contradicted everything by saying, hi, I'm Anastasia. I have 26 or I think I had 21 at the time, 21 implants. And, um, I use them in my magic shows. I know other magicians that use them in the shows and, there was a Senator Melanie Scheibel whose face just, I'll never forget her face when she looked at me. She was so happy because she's a really progressive woman and she was happy to see someone stand up against this ridiculous bill because it really was just ridiculous for so many reasons. I mean, the disabled community alone should have been livid with this because there's so many ways RFID and NFC chips can help the disabled as well. It just was not the right thing to do. They hadn't vetted anything properly. And, um, It turned out that it it got changed. It wasn't passed as is. And now everyone can have as many microchips as they want in Nevada. Well, I can't think of a better representative than you in this case. I will link to the video of your testimony in the show notes at futuregrind.org. And I suggest that everyone go there and check it out. And I hope that other legislators and policymakers make note of this as well. So I wanted to thank you for your efforts there. And I think it's important work. Oh, thanks, man. It was... It was a pleasure to do it. I love setting people straight, especially when they're uh, anti-chip because of religion. I really do feel like there was religious fear there. But, you know, that's just me. I think that politics and religion should not mix. And you mentioned Senator Melanie Scheibel, who was deeply impacted by your testimony. And as a result, we ended up working with her office to plan a cyborg and transhumanist forum at the Nevada State Legislature, which you also participated in. What was your experience during that, and how did those in the seat of government react? Oh, well, um, Skip Daly didn't come down to the table at all, which was disappointing because I really wanted to speak to him, but he probably thought I was the devil. The majority of people who came by were quite welcoming. I mean, there was maybe a handful of people that were a little concerned. There was one guy who still didn't understand that chips are not trackable, and he was thinking this was an NSA issue and they could spy on you. Um But for the most part, I brought all my magic tricks and I was able to demonstrate how I use different things that are implanted in me to achieve different effects. And I showed off the little Queen of Hearts cards. And basically, everyone likes to see cute little blinky technologies working. So it was really easy to convince them. Plus, I I brought a bunch of wearables with me. Um, 
I have an AO, which is a, a, a blue light circadian rhythm resetter that you can wear over your eyes. So I had that on just because it looks badass and explained how that works. I think I was able to convince them of how cool all this stuff could be just by being outward and friendly with them and not seeming um, like an imposing figure. So three years ago, you weren't a biohacker, and now you are deeply involved with this community. What has that been like for you? And how was it for you to get involved with a group of people that were essentially strangers? Oh, well, the grinders that I have hung out with and met have become like family to me. So we get together every chance we can, whether it be for DEF CON or for Biohack the Planet, which is coming up at the end of the month. Um, my house is basically open to any grinder to crash when they need it. We collaborate on things. We talk all the time online. I consider I consider grinders my tribe. Like I really felt like I found a tribe of people that thought the same way I did. When I get these ideas of wanting to build a computer for my leg, they don't say, you're crazy. They say, oh, yes, let's build it. <laughs> so it's the perfect group of people to be around. And then, and especially you, Ryan, you're a great person to be around too. Like you're part of the group. And I especially love that you're always looking out for everybody around you. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And I look forward to speaking with you at Biohack the Planet, which of course is coming up on August 31st and September 1st, 2019 in Las Vegas. And my previous episode of Future Grind, episode 41 with Josiah Zayner, gets into much more detail about this conference for anyone who wants to learn more. But you and I will actually be speaking together about useful human implants, which is going to be a great time. And there are a ton of other amazing speakers lined up as well. But what are you most looking forward to at Biohack the Planet? Um, well, I went to it last year with Rich Lee. We did the eight-hour drive out to Oakland and the eight-hour drive back for a two-day visit, and we crashed on the floor of the Odin, and it was a great time. Um, I'm really looking forward to more of the reactions that we got then when I moderated a talk for Rich and somebody who was uh, – somebody else I can't remember um, – it was a lot of fun. It's just very biohack. The planet is a very laid back conference with a lot of brilliant minds. And these brilliant minds were really interested in the weird stuff that we were doing by implanting things. A lot of them are not aware of it. It's just completely outside the realm. So it's, it's kind of like introducing what we do to a new group of people, which is going to thrill you a lot. And their reactions are great. I mean, they have really good questions and they really make you think because they're really science minded. So it's just, it's really great to cross the, the daredevil implant type person with the super science brain. I really love it. And another project of yours was actually just released a documentary featuring both you and your husband, famed comedian and magician, the amazing Jonathan recently came out on Hulu. Tell us a bit about that project. Uh, sure. Well, for, God, I guess about three, three, three or four years. I always get confused on that. Probably three years. We had a documentarian named Ben Berman who's um, got a lot of work on comedy stations, but he had never done an actual movie before. And in the course of filming us over three or four years, he had to change his trajectory a little bit in how he was telling his story. And what ended up uh, being created was this really beautiful multi-layered movie that doesn't just show Jonathan's life, my life, and the life of someone just going on their final tour because my husband's not very well. He has a heart condition. Uh, because of the problems that the documentarian encountered, he was able to make this multi-layered film that got picked up by Sundance and then later picked up by Hulu. And we never expected any of this. We didn't expect it to be such a huge, well-received movie. But here it is on Hulu now. It's called The Amazing Jonathan Documentary. And it's it's not for the light of heart. I have a pretty crazy life that I'm not going to get into details here, but if you watch it, you'll kind of see what I meant earlier when I was talking about my day-to-day -day stresses and why my spire means so much to me. <laughs> um, but hopefully you enjoy it and you can see the, the entire story being told. Yeah, and I would recommend checking out that movie. It's called The Amazing Jonathan Documentary and is available on Hulu. And I'll link to it in the show notes as well at futuregrind.org. So my last question here, what do you look forward to? What is on the horizon in terms of augmentative tech or advancements that you're most excited about? Well, I don't know if you guys consider Elon Musk 
a biohacker. I do. He's just a really rich one. And that Neuralink that he's creating is think I think it's one of the most exciting things ever. The ability to be able to upload information into your brain and have an extra storage unit outside of your head. <laughs> it's just, it's blowing my mind. So I'm, I'm following that. I tried to be inside the audience when he had his recent Neuralink talk and I didn't get selected, unfortunately, but um, I'm following things like that a lot because the ultimate thing would be an upgrade where basically just like the matrix, you just download information and all of a sudden, you know, Kung Fu. I mean, could you imagine, I don't know if we'll ever get there, but I think that we do need people like Elon Musk with the money that he has and the amount of people that he can employ and the brilliant minds he can put to work to create these ends. Um, so that's the thing that excites me the most as far as like my own DIY grinding biohacking for myself. I'm really excited about the the leg computer, which is the Linux NFC Wi-Fi Bluetooth, which we're calling the Wi-Fi. That's a great name. And I totally agree with you. Elon Musk is doing some amazing work. And whenever I think of an implant that I most want to see, Something that interfaces with the brain is definitely at the top of my list. So I'm very excited to see where Neuralink takes us. But I'm also excited to see where your work goes as well. I know you're constantly pushing forward in doing more innovative things. And every time I see you, it seems like there's something new to talk about or to show off. So keep up the great work, and I look forward to seeing what some of those new things are when we get together in Las Vegas for Biohack the Planet. Thanks again for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it as well. And this has been an awesome talk. Hey, everyone. Ryan O'Shea again. And thanks for listening to my interview with Anastasia. Remember to check out the show notes and more at futuregrind.org. Make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. We also need your help to keep this podcast running. You can donate at futuregrind.org forward slash support or make a purchase at futuregrind.org forward slash store. Till next time, this is Future Grind. Future Grind.